Yeah. First of all, welcome everybody on the, this Sunday afternoon. I'm sure it's a very busy Sunday. Um, so first of all, obviously the JPN, the Jewish Physicians Network, would like to welcome once again, uh, Mari Garabi, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, so Rosh Kolel and Rosh Shiva in Yeshiva Sarbini Yitzchak Al in YU. Um, so for those of you who don't know uh, that much about the Jewish Physicians Network, please visit their website or our website. Um, and there are many other shiurim and podcasts on similar topics uh, to these. Um, so you're more than welcome to, to look at those. Um, so the reason why we thought about this year, this time of year, as Rabbi Will already mentioned uh, briefly, um, transition to clerkship for third years or yeah, third years in residence uh, also uh, starts around this time of year. So we thought it was very apropos for um, uh, Rabbi Willig to address some common issues that come up when transitioning to the hospital and the hospital life that comes along with that. Um, many of these areas we're not as familiar with. Um, so we have the guidance of Rabbi Willig to, to sort of guide us through that. Um, so just one point, technical point, if there's a scenario, so we we compiled a list, a list of question, questions for Rabbi Willig that we'll be addressing. Um, if there are any scenarios that are presented either slightly different than what you've heard or what you've even experienced, if, you're, if you've been in the hospital already, please feel free, if Rabbi Willig allows, to clarify um, and tell us what the, the actual scenario is on the floor if we presented it slightly different than the way it was presented to Rabbi Willig. Um, is that okay, Rabbi? 100%. What did you say? Use the word I didn't catch. Uh, if they're on the floor, meaning if they're oh, no. on... If, if, and if they have, what should they do? They should unmute. And oh, unmute. Anyway, yeah. good. No problem. Okay, let's begin. So the, the um, outline has four different general topics. Each one is divided into subtitles. For example, one has A through H, two has A through E, three has A through C, and four is A through D. Now we'll try to follow the uh, numbering system as was given to me. So one is daily schedule. Early is time, A, to put on towels and tefillin, and daven shachris. So it says in Shechan the earliest time to put on uh, tefillin is what's called mishayakir, towels and tefillin, mishayakir. You can tell the difference between blue and white, or as the Gemara puts it, to see a friend four hours away and recognize him. But what exactly is that? That's a tremendous dispute. That's one zman and the my zmanim that there's no basis for it in the Gemara. It doesn't say anything. There's no way to calculate it except for the using the eye. So what is it? So if you look at a typical calendar, I have, I have one of those things in my, in my house. They give you two different shiru, 10.2 and 11. What's 10.2 and 11? Measuring degree, you're all scientists, measuring degrees of the sun beneath the horizon. And therefore it varies from time to time and place to place how much it is. And that's a certain amount of time. In my humble opinion, we can be, when we're stuck, be more lenient than that. And I'm basing myself on the Kafa Chaim, who quotes Minig Yerushalayim, that says that the shear in Yerushalayim is one hour. One hour before sunrise, that is the shear of Mishayaki. And one hour before sunrise in the spring in Yerushalayim is not 10.2, it's not 11, it's 12.9, which is, uh, gives you an extra 10, 15 minutes, which can be very helpful sometimes. If you want, uh, Yoni, I can uh, send you a copy of my 12.9 that one of my Talmudim worked up for me from New York City. And that's a, it's, it's a little bit earlier than the time you see in your charts. That's what's called Mishayaki. However, if it's impossible, too late, you can put on your towels and fill in as early as Alo Sashacha. When is Alo Sashacha? 16.1 degrees beneath the horizon. That is printed in most every chart. My Smanam has, they all have it. 16.1, which is not 72 minutes flat, it's 72 minutes equivalent based upon the time and the place. That's what I say, the earliest time. If you have to put on the towel, then you may. It's better to postpone the bracha till after Mishayakim, if you can. Even if the brachas be made between Yishtabach and, and, and Yotzeror, even after you finished all davening, before Aleinu, you can make the bracha on towels and film, if necessary. 
Okay, so that's the earliest time to put on a talisman to him. Daven Shachar says also you can daven Shachar says as early as a los Shachar in a pinch. But again, most likely you if you start then it'll take you a few minutes to get to uh, to the Shmon Esrei, which is maybe already going to be Mishayakir. That's worth anything. And you make the broken talisman to him afterwards. Okay, that's a B. If learning early in the morning, what part of Daven can I stay before Alos? Not much. Only brachas, in my opinion. Brachas, you can say any time you wake up, but everything else in Baruch Shama till the end, you should wait till Alos. Of course, you can skip if necessary to, to get to work. You know, the skipping routine that the when you were young, you used to skip and come late. I'm sure now you don't do that anymore. But uh, they all know about you. You skip uh, Ashray and Halalukas, and you skip everything else. But or the only Ashray you start up. You know the you know the routine. Okay. C. Where is the best place to dive in? Can I dive in my parked car, or should I try to find a place to stand? Probably you must find a place to stand. A meet is a very important uh, uh, prerequisite for diving. Of course, if you're sick, you can't. You can't. But it's much better to dive in standing up than sitting down. D. If I know that I won't be able to daven mincha and or with a minion, is it best to daven at the earliest possible time to daven mincha and or marav? Absolutely yes. As important as minion is, just get it in. If you have any doubt later on, get it in whenever you can, and don't worry about the, about the minion. Okay. E. When is the latest time to daven marav and kriyashma? So the daven marav the latest time is alo sashacha. That same sixteen point one we mentioned earlier. That's the earliest. Time to daven shachris is also the latest time to daven ma'ariv. Krishma, so the chatchila should be said before chatzos. Before chatzos, which is that's every calendar that tells you when chatzos is mid- midnight. It depends on what it is. It's, it's around one o'clock now because we're in daylight savings time. And that's the chat, that's the chatchila. But the evidence, there are some who say you can even say shma beyond alos hashachar until till neitzachama. In a real, real pinch, but you shouldn't come to that. You should make sure that you have it all done um, really by chatzos. Give no time to daven shmon esrei, to daven all that stuff after chatzos. But the shma itself, at least in the beginning, if you know the time, should be said before chatzos. It's the first mission of brachos. You all know it. F. When one is stays up all night rounding, what do they not say in davening the next morning? All the kind of shama b'chas Torah. That's a very Good question. Now, if you slept the day before, it's a machlokas. Can we say that the sleep of the day before plus the all-nighter is enough to require a bracha the next morning? This place to see it is in the Piske Chuvas of a encyclopedic work, Simon Memvov. End of footnote 164. That's where it's found this dispute. And although most authorities think you cannot base yourself on that, my personal view was you can. Why? Because according to the Arach HaShulchan, in, in Simon Memvav Sif Yugimu, you, you can make a bracha no matter what, even if you didn't sleep at all, not the day before, not the night at all. And other people agree with him. Even if you didn't sleep at all, that's, if that's found in, there in footnote 160. In the same uh, safer. Seems to me, if you took a nap sometime during the previous day and you are uh, pulling an all nighter, so when you get up and when you get to Davin the next morning, you can make all the brachas. That's what I think. Next, G. How much time before Shabbos should one request to leave? Should one give themselves a double the amount of time it takes to travel? Now, that depends on the case, depends where you're traveling. In some Places you travel in open highways, never any traffic. So it's not right to leave earlier than you have to leave. You shouldn't go to Chil Hashem. You know that if you live in New York City, anywhere, anywhere in New York City or close by, then it's Bergen County, Nassau County, Rockland County, forget it on Friday. Forget it. I'm not even sure if double the amount will do the trip. I'm telling you to take it. I don't want to say how many, how long it could take you. To take it, put it this way. Someone I know just traveled four days ago from Washington Heights to Atlantic Beach to a wedding. Took him more than two hours. More than two hours. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy. So you have to be prepared. And Friday is usually worse. 
So you can't leave the last minute on Friday. The only time you can just, you know, resume it's going to take us in the normal amount. It's an open highway somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Then, then it's an open highway. You know how long it takes you. But in New York City, forget it. H, if I miss it, it's feel it because of patient care. Do I need to make it up? What if I know I'll miss it before in 10 hour surgery, et cetera? That's a good question. Also, the person is busy with patients from before most the most common case is mincha. The busy from the before or chakras, frankly. They miss it busy from before the earliest time for chakras until after chatzos, or you're busy from before chatzos until after shkia, you know, until the entire half a day, which would be six hours in equinox. It could be, well, so you like it more than that because you have a lot of chakras to seven hours, could be much longer in the, in the summer. Anyway, whatever it happens to be, if you're busy with the patients the entire time, you are potter. There is no requirement to make it up. That's what we paskin la locha. On the other hand, if at the beginning of the time you were not busy, so in theory you could have dive in chakras as early as shakra before you got involved in the hospital, or you could have dive in mincha at mincha gudola, which is now around 1.30, before you got to the hospital, you decided to hope to wait for later, then you were una- unable to dive because you got overwhelmed with work, according to some authorities, you would have to make up the next Shemona by davening it twice. If you look carefully in the Mishtabur, Simon, I, and Aleph, Siv, Kod, and Dal, will suggest that. But this, others disagree. Once again, the Piske Chuvis and Simon Kuv Ches, footnote 17, quotes those who disagree. And I would like to also say, to disagree and say that if you were busy, even if you weren't busy the whole, whole time, but from the time you started, you were busy till the end, it's better that you not uh, make up the Shmones. But, but again, it always is good. Okay, end of, of segment one. Any questions on segment one before we go to segment two? You are very quiet doctors, young man. All right, segment two, transportation and Shabbos. A, how to get to and from hospital for call shift on Shabbos? Very simple answer. U-B-E-R, Uber. That's the, the latest craze, Uber. Can okay, they come in two minutes? And they take anywhere you want, cost a few dollars. That's true. B, if you're called in on Friday night for an emergency, are you allowed to go home back home for the rest of Shabbos, or do you need to stay in the hospital until Shabbos ends? Guess what? The same answer. Uber. A lot of Uber back in my opinion, because it's uh, you know the doctor doing a mitzvah, you allow you to rely on Amir al Nachri to have the Uber, the, the Goyesha driver drive you home. C. I know it's preferable to use to Uber than to drive to from the hospital on Shabbos and Yontem, but I live very far from the hospital, and Uber is very expensive, and we can't afford it. Is driving okay if necessary? It seems to me that in the, hopefully you won't be, have to be in the hospital too often. If you have to be in the hospital, stay over in the hospital. I know it's a hardship for the family, but in my opinion, if you know that you're going to be in the hospital, it's it's you have to stay there. Now, it can happen in an emergency, you get called in on Shabbos. Then it's rare, and hopefully you'll be able to afford those few Ubers that you have to take in those emergency situations. If you know in advance, better stay in the hospital. Now, if it's, you have an impossible situation, Uber won't come, you're allowed to drive yourself. Everything to get to the hospital, but you can't come back unless by not coming back, you may decide not to go in the first place and rely on the on the on the on the, on the resident or the intern, which could cause chas v'shalom someone to die. So then, if you know yourself that that could be a problem, you're leaving a lot of drive. But that's only in an in extreme case. D. Re- Rabbi, does yeah, that sorry. mean you're making a not coming? One more time. Point? Talk talk more clearly. <clears throat> does that mean there's going to be a difference between being on call versus having to drive in for a shift? Whereas being on call, I make the judgment call whether or not I have to go to the hospital. While being on shift, I have to go for those 12 hours regardless. So again, in my opinion, if you have to either for 12 hours in the middle of Shabbos, you have to go with an Uber. And if you can't go with an Uber, in my opinion, you have to stay, you have to stay in the hospital for Shabbos. 
because you know it's it's uh, what can you do? People sometimes leave their families behind for other reasons, so that's it. If you know you're going to be there, you can't take an Uber. I'm giving you a, what I call a leniency to go with an Uber. Uh, but as I said before, that's you have to be 12 hours. On call means if you hopefully they call you only for emergencies. You're allowed to carry a cell phone if that's if that what on call means. You're allowed to pick up the cell phone. Obviously, it should be on vibrate if you're in shul. And you're allowed to, you know, if you see who's, who's calling you in, you recognize the number. It's the hospital number, the pager or whatever, the, the, the service is calling you. You must pick up the phone. You must make a judgment. Obviously, you should set up in advance for those who are on the floor, should only call you when it's really serious. You should be able to talk to one of the doctors who's actually there on the floor in real time, discuss this situation. Maybe you can give advice on the phone, which is the best thing. No, doctor, you must come. You must come right now. Okay? You must come. Pikuach Nefesh. Better to go with an Uber. But I'm saying that's going to be a rarity, hopefully. That's not going to happen every week. So you can afford it. Everyone can afford one Uber. So um, then you have to stay in the hospital if you can't afford the Uber back. That's what I think. So I made a distinction between, yes, between on call and uh, those who have shifts. Just to clarify one more thing, Rabbi. Sure, Yoni. Um, so let's say you know that your shift is going to start at 7 a.m. Shabbos morning. Mm-hmm. Uber. Would Uber Shabbos morning, you wouldn't have to go in before Shabbos. That's my opinion. I'm, I, I, why? So why to be with your wife and kids on Friday night? They deserve it. Right? That's why we can be lenient to Uber in at 6 30 in the morning. Got there at 7. Can they really? I'm, the, I, shoot me for saying that. But I'm saying it anyway. Yes. Can I ask a follow up on that? Um, sure. So, in Israel, where we're not sure necessarily that we'll have a non-Jewish driver, would the same apply and to assume that we'll get an Arab taxi driver when we order a get? Oh, boy. That's a hard question to answer. The whole situation in Israel is different. I'm not so familiar with it, what the rotations are. And, you know, there aren't so many Goyesha doctors you can switch with. It's, it's a whole different situation in Eretz Israel. I really think that as much as I'd love to answer you, you're probably better off asking someone in Eretz Yisrael because they're, they're, they're on the scene. So I'm sorry, I'm going to pass on that one. Okay, D. Well, I would Rabbi, answer... to clarify. Sorry? I'm sorry, just to clarify, and, and the flip side of the Ubering, uh, on, on, on Shabbat morning, if your shift ends during Shabbat day, are you able to take the Uber back home as well? Same thing, same thing. If you get off, you get off at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uber back, yes, Thank you. my opinion. D. I'm an intern and I can take one day off for Rosh Hashanah. I live far from the hospital and can't, and can't walk in. So better take one day off for Rosh Hashanah and Uber to the hospital in the middle of the Chag for the second day? Or is it better to work both days in the hospital but avoid driving at all? I don't want to look for a place to stay near the hospital because I would leave, be leaving my husband alone on the Chag. What's the better thing to do? One word, Uber. Shouldn't leave your husband alone for the Chag. Uber. E. How should I take notes on Shabbos? I've heard that ta- trying to use an iPad is tedious and unrealistic. I don't know. They told me today that everybody has a phone. And on the phone, you can... These, can boop, 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 boop. these kids, they, they, tip, they tap with their thumbs and tip, 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 tip. two seconds, they type everything out. And then they can that, from that phone, somebody can print it out if necessary. A non-Jewish person should print it out. I don't know what the word iPad means. I see this kid. Boop, 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 boop. Am I crazy? These kids, they're so fast. It's faster than using a pen. So get one of those things and have someone else print it out if necessary. That's what I think. Again, I'm not, I'm not a techie. Okay. Number th- uh, three. A, what should be done when faced with a controversial procedure like performing an abortion that is also? The answer is don't do it. Don't do it. One, in the case of a mutter abortion, should a Jew woman be preferred based on the sugya? Woman has always said she was there, go ahead, misa. And it seems to me, if you have a case where the abortion is mutter, it's probably a mitzvah to do the abortion, and you should do it yourself. Whether you're male or female, it doesn't make a difference. Just do it. It's a mitzvah. It's probably it's a, a very serious situation we're in, in those rare cases where it's mutter. Now, we, 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 <laughs> you have to get a psaq that it's mutter. You can't just decide on your own, hey, this is mutter. It sounds mutter to me. 
I recommend you call a rub that you know. Ask him if it's motor. There are people who are lenient. Uh, I, I'm included among that group if, if it's necessary, but not, uh, you know, not just in all cases. Okay, B, can I sign a DNR? If not, can I ask someone else to sign it? Wait a minute. DNR is dangerous. DNR, as you guys know better than me, is it means do not treat in many cases. I just uh, let him go. He ready to give up on his own life. We're gonna not gonna work hard to save him. Just be careful with, with DNR. It seems to me DNR should only be utilized if there's no chance of recovery and you're sure that they're not gonna do D DNT, do not treat them for something which can relieve the pain or, or ease some of the suffering or somehow eliminate, extend the life in a, in a proper way, then a DNR is appropriate at the, at the latest stages because you don't want them to crack your ribs for nothing. If you can't, if you're irreversible, there's no chance to, 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 to heal. That's, <laughs> I said it once I walked into my shul years ago. Oh, uh, 30 years ago, I'm guessing. So I hear in the back row two Holocaust survivors, one says the other. Avrum, DNR. So I changed my speech and I said, rip it up. Rip it up. Because DNR means DNT. They, they, they won't take care of you. On the other hand, if it's a, a dire situation, there's no hope of recovery, then it's a mitzvah that's on a DNR. Shouldn't crack the person's ribs. Uh, my mother, Oleha Shalom, the last day of her life, I, it, was, uh, it was just this time, around this time of the year, it was Motsoy Shavuos, came to the hospital and there was a very loyal doctor, oncologist, who was away in the poker nights for three days Shavuos. We have like had this year. They came to see my mother on Monday night, told my father, mate, this can't, this can't, this can't go on long. Lungs are filling up, nothing to do about it. There's nothing to be done. Sign a DNR. Tell my father, please sign the DNR. Otherwise, stop breathing. Start cracking the ribs for nothing. It's impossible. There's no hope. So that's when the DNR is appropriate or similar cases. But otherwise, you should not sign it. If not, can I ask someone else to sign it? Listen, uh, <laughs> if, if, if it has to be signed, someone else should sign it. It doesn't have to be signed. No one should sign it. That's what I would say. Okay, B. Someone is in cardiac arrest and you place a thumper on them, CPR machine, and someone comes in with a DNR and asks you to turn the machine off. Can you? Look, if the DNR was an appropriate DNR, it was written, it was, it was signed properly, as we mentioned before, person is terminally ill, no chance of, of, of any recovery to speak of, then the DNR would have been appropriate from the beginning. It's appropriate now too, strictly speaking. Um, if it was never appropriate and still not appropriate, but he signed the DNR anyway, so by law, it has to be removed. Let someone else do it. Someone else uh, turn the machine off. You shouldn't do it yourself. C. Is there an issue with choosing to treat a non-Jewish patient before a Jewish patient because of the triage or because the non-Jewish patient arrived at the hospital first, he gets treated first? What does Allah say about the triage like the old versus young, sick versus not sick, not so sick, etc.? Oh. It seems to me that from what I understood, that based upon, based upon the law of the land and the protocols of the hospital, it's impossible it's impossible to try to choose a Jewish patient over a non-Jewish patient who came first. As far as I know, it's an impossibility. You lose your license. You just can't do such a thing, unless I'm wrong. That's what I was told. Now you want to know what the halacha is in theory, if there's no government regulations. It seems to me that we also believe in what we call kol hakoidim zacha, whoever comes first is treated first as a general rule, not as a total case, but a general rule. Uh, some disagree. Um, the age is irrelevant. Ir old versus is irrelevant. Sick versus not so sick, that's very relevant. Very relevant. You say one of the cholas sheyesh basakana, one of the cholas sheyem basakana. So of course the cholas sheyesh basakana has priority. None, that's not even a doubt. That's for sure. And there could be even other cases where it seems you have to make a decision. 
who has the best chance of survival based on your intervention? They wouldn't survive without this intervention, they would survive without. Whichever of the two patients has that greater number, that's the patient you should tend to first. That's what I think. The law of the land, I don't know precisely. Don't get involved with the legal problems, but yes, we said second one, but halacha, that's what halacha has to say. Okay, finally, section four, cafeteria A. Would allow to warm up food in a non kosher maggot toaster? If yes, how should they do it? Yes, yes, you, you may do it with a double wrap. Put a double wrap around the kosher food and then nothing can get through. B, is one allowed to use a hot water coffee machine or do we say that the Zaya makes the spout trafe? Unless you put the spout so close, the soup, the trafe of soup, mamish, so close to the to the, to the spout, it's not going to make anything trace. The zay is going to disperse and uh, it won't be a problem. So you have to look and see well, how this, how the machine is being used in the workplace. People putting this trafe soup right up next to it, then of course you have a problem. On the other hand, if they just put it far away, which is normal, and, and in general, the, the zaya will dissipate, it will spread throughout the whole area. It's not pressurized steam. So then there's room to be, to be, to be make up, if necessary. See, we're allowed to use a non-kosher milk. What'd you say? Non-kosher milk? non-kosher milk. What are you talking about? Our coffee cream is actually dairy. I think the answer is yes. Some of them are, some of them aren't. You have to know what the ingredients say. If they have to, it's an OU, you call the OU. Is it, is it dairy or not dairy? And finally, D, we're allowed to eat at the same table as a goy eating tray. The answer is technically speaking, yes. It's found in the Gemara, but uh, it's not so advisable. So try to avoid it if you possibly can. Atkan, I answered your questions. The first round took me half an hour, as we predicted. And now if there are more questions, I'm happy to take them. Just to clarify, the question with the milk was, let's say there's a milk without a hashkacha. Because I know, I think there's a true for Moshe about uh, the factories where they're not allowed to put uh, other materials in if they say it's cow milk. I clap, I'll head. We buy plain milk all the time. Now the plain milk may have some kind of ashkach on it. What are they, what are they, what are they, what are they mashkich on? That it's milk? We know it's milk. We know it's milk without the uh, whatever OU what's on it. So you're allowed to buy Milk without a hechsha of cow's milk on the assumption it's only cow's milk. Any more questions? I was going to say gentlemen, but I see, I should say ladies and gentlemen. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right. No more questions. We'll um, call it I, quit. I have a uh, question. Yes, Brahma. Hi. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of um, like working a shift on Shabbos, I know you're allowed to do it for, like, you can't do anything for yourself, but anything to treat the patient, um, you can you can do. But, like, what about charging your phone because you come home on Friday night and you need your phone for the next day? Or you absolutely, must charge your phone. However, when you <laughs> charge your phone, you should try to put it into the charger, whatever you have, gizmo there, whether we call it shinoi. So if you have to put it down, you put it down like this, you know, backwards. If you have to put something into something, you put it between your fingers like this, not the way you normally would do it. Okay, and then let's say if, if in the hospital you have a hospital phone, should you not be carrying around both your phone and the hospital phone or? Any phones you need to be contacted, you have to carry around. Okay. And if is it preferable to like have an alarm set on a Shabbos clock or is your phone fine? To, like to wake up for your Shabbos morning shift. Ah, uh, uh, any way you set it up is okay. Obviously, a, a mechanical uh, is better than an electrical, and they have these still have mechanical alarm clocks still around. But if if, if if you can't find one, you can set your um, phone or your whatever it is to wake you up. Ruby, is there an advantage to Thank charging? You. Yeah. Is there an advantage to what? To charging your phone with a uh, portable battery versus plugging it into the wall? Uh, 
Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a portable battery charger. I don't know what that is. It seems to me that if if that it, it may be somewhat preferable, preferable, but I don't know how much it costs. I don't know if you can afford it. I guess it's always better to stay away from things which are attached to the wall. I don't think it's a real problem, honestly, but uh, if you want to be machmer, I won't stop you. All right, Yoni, I think we're done. Okay. Thank you very much, Rabbi. I wish everybody great at Slacha, Shemukad Hashem Shemayim. As I tell the doctors all the time, every time you do something and people admire you, and they say how wonderfully you perform your duties, and the cruise to the benefit of the Rabbana Shalom. Yisrolach Hashem Bechah Aspar, the Mephor Shemayim, you would have favor of. So, do a great job. All the best. Take care, Yoni.